I live in a major city and currently don't do a lot of driving due to ongoing issues with my car and as of right now, the time that I'm writing this, the pandemic has made me turn to more delivery apps in general. So the other day at around 1pm I decided to order some lunch after doing a lot of cleaning. I placed the Uber Eats order and found something to watch while I waited for the food. Within a few minutes a driver accepted the order and I noticed right away that the driver, Anthony, was on a bike and didn't have a profile picture or any deliveries on record. At first I wasn't alarmed at all and I was almost amused like, oh wow I guess I'm this person's first ever customer. But then, a full 30 minutes passes with no driver movements on the app, and at this point I think maybe something is glitching out or the driver is stuck. I contact support via the chat option and they ended up assigning a new driver because they couldn't reach the first one. It was odd, but whatever, I just shrug it off. And now is when it starts getting a little weirder though. The new driver assigned is in the exact same spot as the original driver, and they are also on a bike and also have no profile picture, and have no prior deliveries as well, and this driver's name was Lori. I let another 20 minutes pass with no driver movement before I message them myself and say, Hi there, are there any issues with the order? The app shows that the driver saw the message, but I get no response. All this time I'm checking to see if Uber Eats is maybe experiencing issues, none that I could find, and, and at this point, while I'm definitely weirded out, I'm mostly just hungry so I contact support again to request some assistance. They reassign the driver again and apologize for the inconvenience. Same deal, they also tried to contact the driver but with no response. Finally, the third driver assigned is the exact same scenario. Same spot, on a bike, no profile picture, no prior deliveries. Only this time the name is Robert. And before I can react and go about cancelling the order at this point because I'm tired of dealing with this, he suddenly has my food and immediately messaged me the following, Hello, have your food, what's your phone number? And I respond right away with, I'm not super comfortable giving my phone number out when you can just message me here. And he responded again with, What's your number? Be there in 10. How old are you? And at this point the alarm bells are going off and I contact support immediately to have the order cancelled and get further assistance. I get connected to Uber's safety team who informs me that the order has been cancelled. I'll be refunded and I started taking down the details of the strange interactions. As I'm giving the woman on the phone the info she needs, I'm starting to calm down thinking that this was just some creep or something. And that's when I hear a man's voice at the front door. Uh, miss, I got your food. And I can't even describe the chill that went down my spine because the way he said it, and making things even worse, the uber safety woman on the phone with me heard him and as well goes, Is that him? We cancelled the order. I poked my head around the door. Main heavy door was open, metal screen door was closed and locked but allowed us to see each other to get a look at him. And when he saw me on the phone, he went from smiling to looking absolutely furious. He suddenly got right up against the door and kept asking who I was on the phone with, and at this point I started asking him to please leave because he's making me uncomfortable and he's getting more and more angry, and at this point he starts pounding on my door and grabbing the doorknob while shouting to be let in. The woman on the phone is asking if I'm okay, and the man is still shouting, so basically I'm in full meltdown mode at this point and hurriedly close the heavy door to lock it. The man is becoming borderline belligerent as he kicks my door and the woman tells me to call the police. He ended up walking away from the house about a minute after that and back up to the sidewalk, and for a moment, I thought he, you know, screwed off, so I finished my conversation with the Uber safety woman so she could submit the report. Once she submitted it, I called the police and told them what happened. They were incredibly helpful at first, he didn't actually break in or put his hands on me, and they told me if he came back to call again and they would send an officer out. I did end up calling them again and give a full report plus a description of the man since he didn't end up leaving right away. He stayed in the neighborhood for almost 20 minutes. 
According to one of my neighbors, after she heard the yelling, she saw the man I described walk back up from my house to the sidewalk and hop into a truck with another man in the passenger seat. And they apparently just sat there staring at people walking by and just being incredibly sketchy. And that's when she walked back towards my house and asked me what happened. Luckily, she was able to give myself and the cop a description of the vehicle and the other man as well. So basically, this was a very bizarre and uncomfortable experience and I wanted to share it to maybe see if anyone else has experienced anything like this because honestly, I'm still pretty shaken up and will be avoiding delivery apps for quite a while. When I was 11, I'm 40 now, I moved in with my best friend Charlotte and her family. My family and I were not getting on, so Charlotte's mom, Mercy, let me live with them for a few months. I stayed in Charlotte's room and the two of us would get up every day to make our lunches and head off to school. We lived in the nicer part of a poor neighborhood. Mercy worked full time and Charlotte's dad wasn't on the scene. Charlotte's brother Dallas was two years older than us and the self-proclaimed man of the house. He had a whole stack of friends, whose home situations were similar to mine, so it wasn't uncommon for the house to be full of teenagers by the time Mercy got home. Dallas's girlfriend lived next door. I never met her, but I remember that there were always people coming and going from her house. Around this time, Dallas lost his front door keys and we'd started noticing that food was going missing and that things would not be where we thought we'd put them. One day, Charlotte and I came home from school and headed to our room to drop our school bags off. We noticed that we each had an envelope on our pillows. At first, both of us thought that Dallas had decided to write us notes about how he thought we were ugly or smelly, harmless big brother type teasing. My envelope had a drawing on the front that I didn't understand. I remember opening it and finding a letter inside. Charlotte passed me her letter. Though the handwriting was messy, the letter told her how pretty she was. We both knew that there was no way these letters were from Dallas, and that being said, I didn't want to give her mine. The author of mine detailed how they were going to come into my house and do terrible things to me until I was dead. And to ensure that I understood, I realized that the strange picture on the front of my envelope was a crude drawing of a person getting a phallic image shoved down their throat. Terrified, we called Mercy and told her what happened and she in turn called the police. When Dallas came home from school, we took the letters to show him and explained how we found them. He came up to our room to look around and examine our beds and belongings. Dallas called all of his friends over and interrogated them in Mum's room with the door closed. Once he was satisfied that it was none of them, he showed them the letters to see if they recognized anything familiar about them. Then they went out to ask the neighbors if they'd seen or heard anything. They never found out exactly who left the envelopes, and the police said that there was nothing they could do. I don't think Charlotte and I slept much for a week or so after. When some of Charlotte's and Dallas' clothes showed up in the washing line at his girlfriend's house, we figured that he must have lost his keys while visiting her, and that someone there had been coming over during the day to eat our food and steal our stuff. We changed the locks and nothing else happened. I was so scared and so angry. Every time people went over to her house, I wondered if it had been them if they were the one who had snuck into Charlotte's room and delivered those foul letters to us. I was so happy when that family moved away. This story occurred a few years back when I was staying in my grandparents' house during vacation. They lived near the Atlantic Wall, the system of concrete blockhouses built by Germany during World War II. At the time, I was 16 and fascinated with urbex, so I thought it would be a great idea to go explore these. When I arrived on the beach, I started exploring and everything went well since this place is actually public and a lot of people come here like you would do normally on any beach. Time passed by and there was nothing really interesting to see, so I made the decision to go deep into the dunes to find other structures. I found some, but they were all buried in the sand and covered with vegetation. Until I found the one. I was super excited when I arrived. I started to barge in just like I did before. 
but suddenly, a gut feeling stopped me at one of the entrances. I kept quiet and listened. There was this sort of indistinct chatter and moaning. Honestly, I don't know what kept me around after that. For some stupid reason, I chose the option of yelling, Hello, is anyone there? multiple times. The sounds coming from inside stopped and the atmosphere was getting quite tense, so I made my way to the roof. A single ramp, no exit, stupid decision again, but curiosity was just too strong. A few minutes later, a middle-aged man comes out and started the weirdest discussion with me. He asked me if I was alone and what was my age. I was obviously a minor and then he proceeded to tell me what they were doing inside was perfectly right and I quote-unquote shouldn't call the police without waiting for my answers. At the end of this weird little speech, he asked me if I wanted to go inside. Obviously, I refused. Thank God he didn't insist and went back in. As I went away, I passed by one of the other entrances that happened to provide a direct view of the inside. I took a peek and instantly ran out. What I briefly saw was another old man, naked, touching himself, looking directly at me. In the background, I saw many other figures and candles on the ground. I heard some sort of chanting, too. After I put enough distance, I took my phone out and then called the police. What I told them was too surreal for them to believe me, and I was basically laughed at and given a lecture about prank calls. No one believes me other than my dad. He's had weird encounters in those dunes as well. But in the end, I don't care. I have no idea what was happening down in that bunker. This encounter would have happened a little over 10 years ago. I would have been 26 to 27 at the time, but I'm not 100% sure what year this was now. It was sometime between 2011 and 2013, and at the time, I was frequently going out with friends to bars and parties and hanging out until pretty late most weekends. The friend's house that I usually hung out was on a side street just off a main road where a lot of popular and crowded bars and restaurants were. He had to park on the street at his house, and... During the weekend when it was busy, it was pretty common to have to park a number of blocks away. The street closer to the bars was pretty nice, but if you went a few blocks in the opposite direction, it got a little sketchier at night. After a night of hanging out, I had to walk back to my car pretty light, which was parked a number of blocks away towards the slightly sketchier area. This was during the winter, so I was wearing some kind of heavy sweater or pullover and beanie and knit hat. This detail was only important, as you couldn't really gather much idea about what I looked like from a distance in the dark, aside from my general height and build. There wasn't much through traffic as you got further away from the bars, and the roads were pretty dark without any streetlights. As I was walking down the sidewalk, a car started slowly creeping down the street, matching my pace as it pulled up beside me and then stopped. The window of the car rolled down and driving the car was an attractive young woman who said that I looked cold and that I should let her give me a ride to where I was going. She seemed very friendly. I indicated that I wasn't parked very far away and appreciated the offer, but was just going to keep walking. She then tried really hard to convince me to get in the car with her since it was so quote-unquote cold. No small talk to establish any information about me to make sure I wasn't some weirdo, just asking me to get in the car pretty aggressively. Based on what I was wearing and how dark it was, there was no way she really could have had much idea about what I actually look like to possibly find me attractive, and even if she did, I don't know many women who would pick up a male stranger after midnight when they're alone in their car. There were about ten bars nearby that she could have gone to if she just wanted to pick up a guy. There was no reason I could think of that she would have to resort to driving around offering to pick up strangers. She continued driving alongside me and offered me a ride again, which I declined and kept going. I picked up my pace and she eventually drove off. As soon as she was a few blocks away, I quickly got to my car and made sure that there was nobody lurking around or close by. The whole scenario just felt off and didn't make sense to me. I asked my friends about it later and all of the women agreed. They wouldn't offer a random guy a ride at night time in that kind of scenario, even if the guy looked like Ryan Gosling or Channing Tatum. 
My suspicion is that there was someone laid down in the back seat of the car out of view with a weapon waiting to rob anyone who accepted the ride. I couldn't really figure out any reason that she would be offering rides like that to complete strangers in the middle of the night, as it would be very unsafe for her to just pick up random people. I just assumed that there had to be something nefarious going on in that car, and I do wonder what would have happened if anyone just hopped in and went along with her. I'm a retired geoscience professor, one who's had the pleasure of teaching at several of Europe's most prestigious universities. I've had a long and very satisfying career, mostly in the lecture hall during the twilight of my final tenure, but it wasn't always that way. During my more virile years, I undertook a great deal of field research, predominantly in my chosen field of glaciology. The more astute among you might recognize this to be the study of glaciers, but the word is something of a false friend, in that it encompasses any natural phenomenon that involves ice, frost, or cold temperatures in general. Blame it on my upbringing in sunny Malta, but I've always been fascinated with cold weather climates. I find the landscapes to be so alien and otherworldly, so although I feel much more at home in shorts and a pair of flip-flops, I'm in my element when visiting far-flung research stations. So back in the early 90s, when Cambridge University offered me the research opportunity of a lifetime, I jumped at the chance. To cut a long story short, the fall of the Soviet Union meant that a lot of strategically placed Arctic research stations had been completely abandoned. The institutions that owned or used them for research were desperate to keep them from falling into disrepair and even more desperate not to lose the valuable data they contained. So when various universities began reaching out and offering to staff or fund their research stations, they were naturally elated. I was one of the first field researchers given the opportunity and like I said, I jumped at the chance. I was told that I was headed for a research station in Siberia, 30 miles away from any form of civilization. I knew it would be an adventure, but I never anticipated how the whole thing would degenerate into a complete nightmare. The journey out to what was referred to as the Polensky Research Post was the most grueling of my whole career. Hampered by bad weather, broken down bureaucracy, and atrocious infrastructure, what would have been a 12-hour journey to other places took just over 48. And when I arrived at the research station, I found it was in a far worse state of repair than we had been led to believe. Hardly anything worked, the place was a complete mess and even worse, Almost everyone I spoke to said that there was one heck of a snowstorm headed our way. Now this didn't seem like a huge problem right away. The research station's heating systems were functional and were powered by a sturdy looking generator and on top of that there was a much smaller fuel burning backup generator located in a small outhouse type building. Meaning if something did go wrong with the main heating system I could just rely on the backup. I even ran a test on the system, shutting down the larger, cleaner generator to find that the smaller one did indeed function. That was my one big concern scratched off the list. I could put up with crappy food and no means of washing myself for uh, two weeks or so, but without that heating, there was a chance I'd literally freeze to death. I tried to get as much field work done as possible before the snowstorm hit, figuring that I could search for research files and whatnot while I was stuck indoors. Then, on the third day, I watched as the skies started to darken, signaling the imminent arrival of the storm. I didn't have to rush back to the research station, I had already made ample preparations for the coming storm, but seeing it bearing down on me like that was still very intimidating. I figured that I'd be stuck inside for 24 hours at the minimum, and that it amounted to a great excuse to relax and get cozy for a while. What I didn't expect was one of the most harrowing experiences of my life. After making my way back to the research station, I called a Russian colleague on my satellite phone to let him know that I might be out of contact for a few days. Not so much because of the bad weather, although it might dampen the signal a bit, but more because I wouldn't have anything to report because of the storm. After that, all I had to do was get cozied up, boil up some hot water for a few cups of tea, and settle in to read a book until the wind stopped howling outside the research station. Then, once I was tired enough, I climbed into my sleeping bag on my very comfortable Soviet-era bunk and drifted off to sleep. 
I remember waking up to the sound of something rattling in a part of the research station. The place was small, purely functional, just a rumble of iron and insulation, so when that noise started up sometime in the early hours of the morning, it sounded like the whole hab was rattling. I got out of my sleeping bag, then went looking for the source of the sound, only to find that it was coming from the hab's primary generator. Something was malfunctioning, and almost immediately after I set about to fix it, the generator shut down completely. Under any other circumstance, it would have been easy as pie to just walk outside and switch on the other generator, but with the amount of snow that was coming down, I didn't think that I'd be able to get out at all, and if I did, the speed and thickness of the blizzard outside would make it very difficult to do much of anything. But obviously, I had no choice but to try. It was freeze inside, or freeze outside. The doors to the research station's living area, what we usually call the hab, was always open outwards, not inwards. It basically locks you in if the snows are piled high enough, but it also prevents snow from wedging the door open if you were able to open it inward. A few hours more and I'd have been completely snowed in. But since the generator failed pretty early, I was able to shove the door open enough to actually get through it. First problem solved, I told myself, and it gave me a little boost, but the confidence only lasted as long as it took for me to look outside. The blizzard was so thick I could barely see three or four feet in front of me, so bad that when I finally ventured outside after laying up as best I could, I couldn't actually see the station's outhouse. I had a rough idea of where it was, but Walking off into the blizzard with that seed of doubt germinating in my mind, it was enough to send shivers down my spine. I consider myself a man of science, but the kind of hope that I harbored that day transcended anything rational or logical. I prayed that I'd see the outline of that little outhouse in front of me, and I promised myself that I'd never take warmth for granted ever again if I was just able to get this generator on. But no matter how far I trudged through the snow, the outhouse didn't appear. There was a brief moment when I started to panic, but I kept myself calm and traced my steps back to the hab, then tried another angle under the assumption I'd been mistaken. That time, a wave of relief washed over me when I finally saw the outhouse come into view, but my heart sank once again when I saw how much snow had piled up around the entrance. Stay out in the blizzard, and I might be dead from hypothermia within just 30 minutes or so so each second of clearing that snow away was another closer to death. I clawed the snow away from that outhouse like a man possessed, knowing that I didn't have a moment to spare, and thankfully, I was able to pry that door open without completely clearing the way. Once inside, I had to crank up the generator a few times before pressing the large ignition button. This is the same generator I had already tested just days prior, and I found it to be working just fine, so... When I got into that shelter, I thought the worst was over. Aside from one more trek back to the hab, I'd be warm, toasty, and out of danger again. But after revving up the generator and shoving my gloved thumb into that big red ignition button, nothing happened. No rattling, spluttering, or chuttering, just complete silence. And in that moment, I have the distinct memory of thinking, I'm going to die here. As the wind howled outside the outhouse, I could feel myself getting colder and colder, and with that cold came a distinct kind of drowsiness. I've never had hypothermia before, but I knew that was one of the telltale signs, and it meant that I didn't have long before the icy cold did irreversible damage. I tried and tried and tried again, and in the end, I got the backup generator working. I let out the most pathetic yelp of a victory cry, and then trudge back to the hab to warm back up. I won't lie, once the magnitude of the situation hit me, I got rather emotional when I realized that that research trip could have been my last. Just after 1am, I was sat in my living room watching Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs, browsing Reddit the most boring Saturday night ever. And then someone's knocking. I live with my brother and there's a guy who visits him sometimes, so I assumed it was him and just opened the door. And there was a random man in his 40s, looking kind of sus, saying, sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm looking for a taxi place. So I said town center and he kept apologizing, 
asking if he woke the kids. He's also very close to the door. I don't have any kids, but I said yes, hoping that he'd buzz off. I was scared that if I tried to close the door that he'd push it in. I got so anxious that I started shaking, and he goes about that taxi again and says, Can I ask you a question? I got divorced yesterday. You're beautiful. And a car was coming, so I said thanks. You know, I tried to be polite so he wouldn't get angry and aggressive, and shut the door, and I just stood by the window to make sure that he was gone. Jesus, how was I so stupid? It could have ended badly, especially since I live in a shady area and my brother wears headphones all the time so he probably couldn't even hear. Why was he asking about kids? To see if I was alone? And he went in the direction that the car was coming, so I don't know if it was a random car or someone picked him up. Was he a thief or just a drunk and I had the lights on so he knocked? I really hope that I start thinking before I do stupid stuff like that again. I was 16 and picking out something for my prom date. A man who reeked of feces and urine kept looking at me, but hey, it's Walmart, am I right? Anyways, he starts inching closer to me and I greet him with a smile because when I was young I truly believed the world's problems could all be solved through kindness. He started talking to me and asked who I was buying my stuffed animal and chocolate for. He then proceeded to ask me if I've ever been intimate with them, and that gave me a little shock. And then he started to reach out to grab me and I noticed that there was feces all over his hands and I backed away. I can only imagine the shock that I must have had on my face. He told me how nice I am, then asked if I was a nurse and if I could go to the bathroom and help him clean up. He smiled at me. His eyes were genuinely terrifying. I had never encountered anything like that before and I paused and just said, I'm not a nurse and tried to walk out fast but still composed. As I turned the ignition, I noticed him jogging towards my car. I never burned out of a parking lot faster in my entire life. A few years ago, I lived in a large apartment complex. My unit was at the very end on the first floor. A lot of strange people lived there but seemed pretty harmless. One night my boyfriend was over, thankfully, and we were watching a movie. I noticed a shadow pass by the window, but then I felt like it didn't completely pass by, I guess. At first I started feeling like I'm being watched and too scared to turn and look. I finally look and see the silhouette of a person and a pair of eyes peeking in between the space and the blinds. I told my boyfriend someone was out there and he jumped up and we saw the person's shadow run away. My boyfriend peeks out the window and we assume he ran around the back of the building. A few minutes later, there was a knock on the door. My boyfriend and I just kind of look at each other because it's like 1am. I told him not to answer it because I don't want to open the door to anyone. And after a minute of discussion, he's adamant on answering it so I tell him to just at least grab a knife. He opens the door and thought no one was out there. He looked over and saw a man behind a nearby tree doing the come here motion with his hands. We called the cops, and they say they would keep an eye out, but we never heard anything anymore. In the moment, it felt like the legitimate beginning of a scary movie. When I was in middle school, I remember taking a basic health class, and this must have been fifth grade because we had to watch the infamous video where we learn about our bodies and reproductive organs and had to watch a video of a woman giving birth. I remember asking a female friend of mine an inappropriate question regarding the video that we had just watched while walking in the hallways without realizing the vice principal was in earshot. He called me into his office to scold me until I explained that it was a question revolving around what we had seen in class. He calmed down and then ended up chatting casually with me, a little too casually. Maybe in an attempt to seem cool and relatable, he explained that he had a tattoo. I asked him what it was and he showed me it was a tattoo of an artistic looking fish on his shoulder. Now even back then, I thought the tattoo was incredibly corny, but 
It was fitting considering the guy was kind of dweeby. He then went on to tell me that the tattoo artist who tattooed him in New Hampshire went on to murder and dismember two women a year later and was sentenced to life in prison. I have no clue why he thought it would be appropriate to share this story with a middle schooler, but I was absolutely shook by the story for the following week and never forgot it. My family owns a boutique in a very big city here in the south. Our boutique is located in a very wealthy neighborhood, but that doesn't say much. If you go not even a mile north, south, or west, or east, you'll enter rough areas of the city. With that being said, we have a lot of homeless, drug addicts, and sketchy people in our general area, and they try to come into our stores. When these people come in, we are also nice, respectful, and treat them just like we would our normal customers. We try not to judge by their appearances. However, we don't tolerate the begging, stealing, or soliciting. So, we've all had our share of weird encounters at our store. However, I think my most recent encounter was the creepiest. Last week, getting ready to close, I was tidying up the store when a woman came in. I greeted her as normal and everything seemed smooth sailing, I suppose. She was looking around and engaging in conversation about some of our pieces when all of a sudden things changed quickly. The vibe and feeling of the room just felt eerie, so I moved behind the counter to just create a barrier. She began by grabbing one of our candles that has the saying, I love you to the moon and back across the front. I think this is what originally triggered her. She began talking about her family and how she would read the book, I love you to the moon and back to her triplets that she didn't know that she even had. She then started telling me about her life being married to Ryan Gosling and how she recently killed him because he kept poisoning her and hiding her three sets of triplets and daughter from her. At this point, I was just listening. I didn't want to upset her any more than she already was. When she finished, she began walking around the store again, telling me how she just got out of jail for stabbing someone and at this point, she gets about four feet from my counter and tilts her head, looks me in the eyes and says, I really feel like chopping you up right now. We were the only two in the store at this time and I was in shock. I had no clue what was about to happen. Up until then, she was just rambling. This was the first instance of her showing aggression. Luckily, seconds after that statement, another customer, one of our regulars, came in and the woman who just told me that she wanted to chop me up, grabbed her stuff and walked out the door. My regular could feel the tension as I rushed behind her and locked us in the store. I'll never let that person in again. I'm guessing around seven years ago, my older brother and several of his friends went on a camping trip in rural Maine. When they drove up there, they decided to stay in a random motel nearby the skiing trails. He said it looked pretty run down and sketchy, but being college kids at the time, they didn't care much and just wanted a cheap place to sleep for the night. After a day of skiing, they got some drinks at a local bar and headed back to the motel to get some rest. As they were all hanging out in their motel room, my brother opened up a desk drawer to store some of his things in and and what he found inside the drawer made his jaw drop in horror. There was a coiled ethernet cord with dried blood stains all over it. As if this discovery wasn't terrifying enough, about an hour later, all the lights turned off all of a sudden. My brother walked outside and saw that there wasn't a single light on in the motel. He went to the front desk and the guy working there explained that the power had went out. It was nighttime at this point so everything was completely pitch black. My brother spent the rest of the night awake and scared out of his mind. The power didn't turn back on until the next morning. My brother took a photo of the bloody ethernet cord, but sadly I just texted him asking if he still had the photo and he can't find it on his phone or iCloud. I really wish I could have shared the photo here because it truly is shocking to see, and from the look of it, I can imagine someone was brutally stabbed and strangled in the room that he was staying in. I also think it's pretty stupid that he didn't call the police and at least fill out a report. The 
This past summer, I started hearing a voice when I went into the bathroom. It seemed to be coming from the flat upstairs. At first, I thought it was just one of the owners of the place talking from his room since the layout has the main bedroom next to the bathroom and the walls are thin so sound easily goes through. I thought nothing of it, and plus the voice was accompanied by a new creaking sound as if though they were lying on an old bed so perhaps he was bedridden and that's why I heard him all the time. But one day I started to worry. Getting out from the shower I could swear a few of the words I managed to understand seemed directed to my body but there were so few that I thought I was just being paranoid. See, I wasn't comfortable when I first moved into the house. The second I stepped foot in, I worried about being spied on. No clue why. There was no reason to think so, but I remembered a movie about someone moving into a house with cameras, and I started to worry. I even jumped right out of bed one night a few years ago because I'd seen a camera at the end of a cable hanging a few centimeters from my face. It took a while to realize that it had been a dream, so I just thought it was my mind being an idiot. The voice kept coming through the bathroom's roof all through summer, and looking up, all I could see was the hole that had been opened right above the toilet to get to a leaking pipe. It had been there for a while, not wanting to waste money on closing it down until I knew for sure the leakage had been patched properly, since it wasn't the first time I had issues with that. All you can see in that hole is brick and cement a beam and the big pipe taking waste out in the building, and darkness up above where the light can't reach. Nothing weird in there, so I was never uneasy to leave it open for a while longer. Until a month or so ago, when TMI, I was taking a dump under the familiar sound of that voice and creak. I'm fairly constipated and it got worse during summer, so I was having trouble and I whispered to myself, damn it, or some close translation because my native language isn't English to which I immediately heard what felt like a reply, a single word from that all familiar voice, push. I looked up in a panic at the hole above me with the exposed pipe, wondering if someone had been looking at me this whole time. I didn't see anything but the voice stopped, the creaking stopped, and everything was quiet. I went to investigate later, phone in hand, but there was nothing there. I used my phone camera to try to see if a lens gleamed back, but it was all the same as it had always been any time I investigated to look for water. I started wondering if there might be a hole just big enough that someone could fit an endoscopic camera through without arising suspicion, something that could be slipped in and out. There hasn't been a voice or creaking since. It stopped in that instant and I haven't heard it since, a month later. Sometimes I wonder if I didn't hallucinate the whole thing. I never had any in my life, but it was all just so strange. My upstairs neighbors are a bunch of parasitic pieces of crap that have me tortured with constant water leaks, so it wouldn't surprise me if they're also just a bunch of creepy pervs. Click the join button to become a member today for exclusive content. What I'm about to share, only a couple people know, but I felt like sharing might be cathartic. Warning, this isn't a pleasant story. When I was in around second grade, my parents got divorced. My father was depressed and my mother started dating. She met a guy and one night she brought him by. He seemed nice enough. He gave me a guitar. And it wasn't long before my mother moved out and my parents sold the house. She took me and my sister and moved in with this new man. I was starting third grade in a new school with a new guy in my life and my father trying to build himself back up. It wasn't long before this new man started his reign of terror, though. I don't remember what was first. Was it drinking tablespoons of cod liver oil as punishment only to vomit it back up seconds later to have to do it again for making a mess? Was it having to kneel against a wall with books on my head and in my hands with bottle caps under my knees for what felt like hours? Was it having to stand in time out, not even being allowed to go to the bathroom until I soiled myself? My sister was saved by my father, but I couldn't leave my mother, so the abuse only got worse for me. I think some of the worst abuses I endured were having to sit at the table in my own urine or feces all night long and going to school with no sleep because I wouldn't eat potato salad or some other food I would gag on. I remember visiting my mother in the hospital as she was vomiting up charcoal that they had pumped into her stomach after she tried to take her own life. I didn't know that at the time, but I do now as an adult, and... I'm not sure how I feel about that. 
Am I mad at her for being willing to escape for herself, leaving me with that monster for God knows how long? I wasn't free of him for two years. Two years of nightly torture. Two years of standing and urinating myself. Two years of fear. Two years of vomiting. And two years of pure hell. Even when she left him and took me with her, my mother was broken. I spent a whole year alone in our new apartment every day. I didn't have school, I didn't do anything, and I remember one day my mother was angry because I left my sister's pogo stick outside and she strangled me on the couch until I nearly passed out. Everything started to fade to black. My life never really became better, just less horrifying. Now fast forward to around 17, 18, I'm, I'm at McDonald's with my girlfriend at the time and her brother when I see that man walk in. I don't know for sure that it was him, but at that moment I was convinced and began climbing over the table, seething mad, ready to kill this man for what he did to me. Not assault him, but kill him. The two of them held me down and calmed me down until we left, and I swear I've seen him other times. The thing is, I don't know if it was him or any man that looks like him just triggers that reaction. Am I putting his face onto every tall, skinny, bald man that I see? I don't know. I know this isn't the scariest of stories, but it was hell for me, so just be careful, people. There are truly real monsters out there. This story was relayed to me by my younger brother, as when everything went down I was apparently asleep. I think about this every day and I feel so guilty about it. It's not inherently very scary, but I always think about what could have happened. Before I begin to tell this story, there needs to be some background details. So when I, a female, was 11 years old, my father abandoned my two younger brothers and my mother. It was a very dark and sad time in our lives. After he left, everything went downhill from there. We had to move out of our house and into my grandmother's house until my mother could find suitable living for us. We lived with my grandmother for a few years before my mom had saved up enough money to get us housing in a duplex. This duplex was located in not the very best part of town. All the houses surrounding it were just nasty and dilapidated. Specifically our house was the bottom part of the duplex. The grass surrounding the foundation of the house was dead and gross and the floors were slanted in certain rooms and most importantly to this story, the back door did not shut all the way. The lock and handle was kind of jammed all the time so it wouldn't close properly. The upper part of this duplex was a one bedroom kind of deal. I only later found out this as an adult that it was used as an adult film studio and illegal substances were transported and exported here. Random people were always coming and going at all hours of the day. The door to this house was around the back of our house connected to our back porch. But it was all we had at the time and we had to make do. And during this time at our new house, my mother was working three jobs to support her three children, so she was rarely ever home except very late at night after finishing her night shift. So one night, it was just my brothers and I alone. I had gone into the bedroom I shared with my mom and was just playing around on my iPad that I had gotten for Christmas and eventually fell asleep. My younger brothers were in our living room playing on our old Xbox 360. I woke up to my brother shaking me awake and saying that there was a man who had just kicked open our back door and walked into the kitchen. At first I was confused because I hadn't heard anything and I had been asleep during the whole thing. My brother kept saying to grab my iPad and text my mom so I grabbed it and just texted her a message. My brother then told me that him and my other brother had just been playing video games when they heard a man yelling around the back side of our house and went to the kitchen. He was yelling about some girl needing to open the door or he was going to do something bad. I only found out later that he had confused our house for the house above ours. The man kept yelling for a woman, saying that she owed him money and he wanted it right now. He then proceeded to kick our door, causing it to swing open. He was expecting a lone woman in her house, but was instead met with the confused and shocked faces of two young boys. The man's face dropped along with his gun and he mumbled a pathetic apology, walked out the door and closed it on his way. That was essentially all that happened, but thinking back on it as an adult, I always wondered what could have happened if he had been more of a disturbed person, seeing two young kids alone and 
decided to ditch his plans of finding the woman who owed him money. I try not to, but it still bugs me every time I think about it. We told my mother everything that had happened again after she had come home from work and she called the police. However, I don't recall anything coming of it because the man left on his own will. It's still one of the scariest moments of my troubled childhood. While on the lam for two and a half years, a Japanese man wanted for the murder of a British woman says he scissored off his lower lip, dug two moles out of his cheek with a box cutter, and gave himself a nose job in an attempt to obscure his identity. The case became one of Japan's highest profile murders after Hawker's body was found in a dirt-filled bathtub on the balcony of Ichihashi's apartment. When 22-year-old Lindsay Hawker was approached on the train by a young man who asked her to teach him English, she had no idea that hiding behind the innocent facade was an evil sadist. Just four days after the pair agreed to meet for a lesson, the Brit's body was found sprawled in a bloody bathtub filled with soil and sand. The young teacher on a gap year in Tokyo, Japan, had been bound and gagged with plastic ties before being brutally assaulted in a frenzied attack. Her skin was covered in bruises and she had been strangled before she died on March 24, 2007. When she was found, her hair had been shaved off and her belongings were scattered across the room. Cops quickly identified the killer as loner Tatsuya Ichihashi, 28, and nine officers surrounded the monster's apartment whilst he was still inside. When Ichihashi realized police were swarming his home, he grabbed his rucksack and, before even putting shoes on, sprinted downstairs in a panic. But what if should have been an easy arrest for the cops soon turned to utter panic when the monster came running out of his door. He was then seen again as the chaotic manhunt continued, but evaded cops once more by zigzagging through the street. This would be the closest the evil murderer came to being arrested for over two years. As the nationwide hunt ensued, Ishihashi fled to an island in Okinawa and worked for 14 months at a construction company. He endured grim cosmetic surgery and deformed his face to try and throw off any suspicions. The vile procedures saw the bloodthirsty individual increase the height of his nose, add a fold to his eyelids, thin his lips, and remove moles on his cheek. He had an obsession with physical fitness and violent manga, a form of Japanese cartoon. Eventually, officers received useful leads from a cosmetic surgery, a construction company employee, and a ferry worker who recognized the killer. They swarmed the area, and finally, on November 10, 2009, Ichihashi was captured in Osaka whilst trying to board a ferry to Okinawa. For 31 months, the evil beast had evaded any justice for brutally violating and taking the life of the young teacher. Lindsay's distraught family pushed for Ichihashi to be executed through Japan's death penalty procedure. They were horrified when lawyers successfully argued that he should be kept alive, based on the potential for him to reform. On the 21st of July 2011, the Chiba District Court sentenced Ishihashi to life imprisonment for the murder of Lindsay Hawker. A judge at the case, Masaya Hata, said that he was disgusted at the heinous crime. The victim had her dignity violated and life taken away from her while going through unbearable pain. At the age of 22, her future was taken away, he added. But Ichihashi's devastating impact on the Hawker family didn't stop there. He went on to write a book detailing the horrific acts from his prison cell before offering Hawker's horrified mum and dad the royalty money which they refused. It sold over 100,000 copies and was successful in Britain, so much so that the story was made into a film, I Am Ichihashi, Journal of a Murderer. Today, Ichihashi remains behind bars to serve out the rest of his sentence. I was working on a no-budget film, a really trashy script, weird plot, no redeeming values at all. And toward the end of the production, me and the director were going around getting second unit inserts. We were on 59th Street at 6am on Sunday morning, unloading the camera. We were going up to a penthouse he knew of to get a shot looking down into Central Park. No one knew about the film other than the production crew and actors. It would never, ever have been mentioned in any media. 
So the director and I are unloading and there's no one around, except for one homeless man. He's shuffling along the sidewalk heading in our direction. He's one of the sad, mentally ill people that our society refuses to help, so his schizophrenia is untreated and he's out on the streets and he's talking to himself non-stop as he comes along. When he gets close to us, he looks up at us and says, And here are these guys that I'm making that movie about. And he proceeds to rattle off the entire plot line as he walks past, as if he were reading the IMDB synopsis. None of our equipment was visible, so there's no way anyone would recognize us as a film crew. The director and I just looked at each other like, what in God's name just happened? Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 p.m. EST, and there are super fun live streams every Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday nights. You should join. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit or over email, and you might even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. All links down in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, to get enough enrichment in your enclosure. <laughs>